I posted a video about a half a year ago called Elden Ring and the Seven Deadly Sins. Ever since making that video, I knew I wanted to follow it up somehow with Elden Ring and the Seven Heavenly Virtues. Problem is, as I'm sure most of you that have actually played Elden Ring can imagine, it's much easier to spot sins in the lands between than it is to find virtues. In my sins video, I took the seven shard bearers of Elden Ring and assigned them to a sin. Those sins are sloth, gluttony, lust, envy, greed, wrath, and pride. I do definitely think that some of the bosses and their sins could be interchangeable, but I stand by the final product. But what are the seven virtues, and who would I say exemplify them? The seven virtues are, in the order we're going to talk about them today, charity, temperance, humility, diligence, patience, kindness, and chastity. My original idea was to assign a virtue to each of the remaining remembrance bosses. There are 15 remembrance bosses in Elden Ring, and we talked about seven of them in the sin video which just leaves us with eight to choose from. I said that this was my original idea because I had actually abandoned it for a time, but after weeks of research, I think I can make it work, and to be honest, most of them aren't even really a stretch. Regardless of if you agree with me or not throughout this video, please keep in mind that this discussion is just for fun and it's a good excuse for me to discuss the lore of Elden Ring with an interesting twist on it. So sit back and prepare to cry. Oh, sorry, that's not my thing. Damn, I just realized I don't have a thing. Gonna have to work on that. Although before we get started, Started, you should subscribe if you're interested in this type of video. I haven't begged for subscribers in my last several videos, and I am definitely paying for it. That's enough yapping though, let's get into more yapping. The Elden Beast is a very strange entity in the universe of Elden Ring, and not one that I've had particularly kind words for, at least as far as a final boss goes. Its origins are simple to explain though. Through just a few item descriptions, we receive a fairly cohesive backstory. From the Elden Star's incantation, we learn that long before our adventure in Elden Ring begins, the Greater Will sent a Golden Star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring. Then, from the description of the Elden Remembrance, we learn that the Elden Beast is a vassal for the Greater Will and is the quote, living incarnation of order. This is all well and good, but without actually understanding what the Greater Will is, the information I just provided is basically gibberish. The Greater Will is widely considered to be an outer god, but I don't think that's actually the case. Smotown, one of my absolute favorite YouTubers, has a video on their channel called The Greater Will is Not an Outer God. In this video, Smotown explains that the outer gods, the god of rot, the formless mother, the outer god, of the Deathrite Birds and the God of Frenzied Flame are capable of interacting with the world and inflicting their will upon it. What sets the Greater Will aside from these other cosmic entities is the fact that though the Outer Gods may be able to interact, none of them have the affinity to create life in the same way that the Greater Will has demonstrated. The Greater Will represents a more Abrahamic depiction of a god, a god who, as Hayata tells us, fractured the One Great, thus creating births and souls in the way that we see them in Elden Ring today. Though she does go on to say that the Greater Will made a mistake. Following the fracturing of the One Great, living beings were also forced to suffer things like torment, despair, and affliction. To me, this is a very Christian depiction of God, an omnipresent being who created life in their image, but also created life with a free will. A greater will, if you want to get real meta about it. This free will is usually the source of troubles within man, but it's also what makes us, us. That being said, the Greater Will does have an agenda of some kind, and that agenda can be described in one simple word, order. Through the creation of the Elden Beast and thus the Elden Ring, the Greater Will displays that its one single priority is to bring order to the Lands Between, regardless of what form that order takes. Our character finds the Lands Between in a state of disarray. The Elden Ring has been shattered and thus order has been disrupted. Regardless of what ending the player chooses, they are in some way restoring order. Again though, that order may be pretty ugly in some endings. The Blessing of Despair ending, for example, sees all living beings, present and future afflicted with the omen curse, and while that is an unfortunate fate, it is order in some capacity. To put this freakish line of logic into simpler terms, when everyone is cursed, no one will be. That's just an example though to illustrate that the greater will again doesn't care how it comes, it just wants order. Now I've talked this whole time without even mentioning the virtue of charity, but I think my point might be pretty clear by now. Charity is giving help to those in need, and in a world now full of life from fracturing the one great, I'd say that the charity that the elder Beast, or more accurately, the Greater Will has given, is order itself. I know the Elden Beast isn't literally the Greater Will, but as I quoted earlier, it is the living incarnation of order and could itself be considered charity. 
Okay, I'm sure some of you are laughing at the idea of Godfrey, the warmonger, the lord of the battlefields, the axe of Queen Merica, being given the virtue of temperance. And that's absolutely fair. I mean, in my video about the seven deadly sins, I said Godfrey is the personification of wrath. And while I do still stand by that idea, Godfrey has made two specific decisions that tell me that he is more than just his lust for battle. But first, let's give Godfrey a little backstory so that we can better understand those decisions. Godfrey, like our own player character, is tarnished, or you could say he is a tarnished. We'll touch on what that means in a moment, but another important note about Godfrey is that he wasn't always Godfrey. He was once known as Horalu, a warrior who knew no equal and had strength beyond what was ever seen, whether it be humans, dragons, or whatever other creature you can think of. It was this very strength that caught the eye of Queen Merica. Merica is essentially the goddess of the lands between at this time. She established the Golden Order, thus satisfying the Greater Will's yearning for order, and as an Empyrean, a special type of being, Merica ascended to godhood. Merica saw Horalu's potential and invited him to be her consort. This union is what created the idea of Elden Lord as we know it, the consort to whichever god is currently maintaining order. As the first Elden Lord, Horalu needed to find a way to quiet his warrior spirit, and so he, as the Godfrey icon describes, took the beast regent Sarash upon his back to suppress the ceaseless lust for battle that raged within. This is when the name Horalu would be abandoned for a time and he would henceforth be known as Godfrey. The quelling of his bloodlust through Sarash didn't make him any weaker though, it simply made him less ferocious which would ultimately make him more intelligent and a more well-rounded person. He would prove his unwavering strength strength by conquering the race of fire giants that lived in the mountaintops. I'll get more into the war against the giants in the next section, but Godfrey was successful in his campaign. This victory would see the beginning of the age of the Erd Tree and the Golden Order would flourish. Sometime after this, Godfrey and Merica would bear three demigod children, Godwin the Golden, and the two omens that we discussed in the Seven Deadly Sins video, Morgoth and Moog. Godfrey went on to spread the light of the Golden Order by battling those who stood in its path. Notably, he would lead the siege of Castle Morn, and he would also have his greatest battle with an opponent that we don't know much about, the Storm Lord. For a long time, I thought the Storm Lord was referring to Placidious Axe, and that's definitely not the case. Personally, I believe the Storm Lord was a Stormhawk of some kind that ruled over the area that we now know as Stormvale Castle. Regardless of the Storm Lord's identity, it is said by the Elden Crown description that when his last worthy enemy fell, it was then, as the story is told, that the hue of Lord Godfrey's eyes faded. Godfrey and his warriors were stripped of their grace by Queen Merica. This betrayal by Merica may be perplexing, but either way, Godfrey Godfrey and his kin became tarnished, and were forced out to the Badlands where Godfrey would eventually die. When the Elden Ring was shattered though, Grace was returned to the Tarnished who had been exiled, including our own character. We Tarnished return to our home across the fog, the lands between, and you play the story from there. Near the end of our journey, we encounter Godfrey and do battle with him. Though I would like to note quickly that the golden version of Godfrey that we fight is just an illusion created by Morgoth to slow us down. Once we're up against the real deal though, the battle is intense. It gets more insane when we push Godfrey to his limits, and in a last ditch effort to return the warrior spirit that once laid within him, he slays Sarash, thus unleashing his fury once again. He falls, of course, and we become Elden Lord, but let's get back on track with the theme of this video. How on earth could Godfrey be seen as anything even resembling temperance? Well, like I said, it's two decisions that he makes that seal the deal for me. First, Godfrey didn't have to become Elden Lord. He chose by his own volition to make that vow, and accepting Sarash as his regent to restrain his fighting spirit was a choice that I don't think many characters could have made. The other decision Godfrey made was to not retaliate against the Golden Order, even though he had so mercilessly been betrayed. Merica is a very complicated character, and it's been theorized that she banished the Tarnished so that they may one day return and restore order, as she must have known that chaos was going to soon ensue. Back to Godfrey's restraint though, I think there are plenty of other characters who would have immediately tried to take revenge, and because he didn't order his Tarnished to oppose Merica, our character was able to come home much later and restore some semblance of order. I called Godfrey the personification of wrath, and though temperance is meant to combat gluttony, I think Godfrey did a good job at fending off both of those sins as best he could.
The fire giant we meet in Elden Ring is not unique, or at least he wasn't at one point in time. The giants were a race that made their home in the not-so-friendly area that we now know as the mountaintops of the giants. In the mountaintops, the giants drove out the ice dragons that had resided there before their arrival. It's not clear how long it took, but at some point, the giants would build the Forge of the Giants. There's not a lot of lore about the Forge itself, but it is certain that eventually, the god of fell flame would manifest itself in the Forge. The giants were gifted the powers of this god and this concerned Merica greatly. As we see near the end of Elden Ring, the Forge of the Giants is a powerful tool, as the Flame of Ruin that lays within is able to burn the Ur Tree with relative ease. Whether they had the intention to or not though, Merica wasn't going to sit idly by and let the Giants even have a chance at destroying the Ur Tree. She ordered Godfrey and his warriors to attack, and the war on the Giants began. Like I said before, the defeat of the Giants ushered in the Age of the Ur Tree, as the Golden Order now essentially had no one to oppose it. So, if the giants were slain, what's up with this weirdo? Well, even though the giants were defeated, that didn't mean the flame living inside of the forge went with them. Merica would have been foolish to leave the forge just sitting here for anyone to use, and so she made sure that one giant was left alive to guard the forge against intruders of any kind. Upon realizing the flames of their forge would never die, Queen Merica marked him with a curse. O trifling giant, mayest thou tend thy flame for eternity. The curse she set upon the fire giant made it so that he couldn't wield the flame of ruin and harm the Ur tree. That curse is exactly why I think the fire giant giant fits perfectly with the virtue of humility. Yes, it's forced. No, he doesn't have much of an actual character, but that's kind of the point. Humility exists in the opposition to the sin of pride, and the fire giant, sadly, doesn't have a shred of that left. It's a sad story, and another example of Merica's incredibly questionable ideology, but it's at least a story that's simple to understand. Speaking of Merica being insane, let's talk about her shadow, Maliketh the Black Blade. First though, I mentioned earlier that Merica is an Empyrean, but I didn't really explain what that means, and to understand Maliketh's story, we're gonna need to know more about the Empyreans. What an Empyrean is, and how they come to be in the universe of Elden Ring is hard to nail down, but we know for sure that an Empyrean is a being that is capable of ascending to a type of godhood like Merica did. Empyreans are not a race, nor is being one entirely genetic. Merica is part of the Numen race, and the description of the Numen's rune states, the Numen are said to have come from outside the lands between, and are in fact of the same stock as Queen Merica herself. Numen aren't automatically Empyreans, but it seems like it could be partly genetic. Merica and Radagon bore two children, Melania and Mikola. Both of these children were afflicted with some type of curse, Melania with the Scarlet Rot, and Mikola with Eternal Youth. They were cursed like this because Merica and Radagon are the same f***ing person. I know, it's too much to go into, but the point is that Melania and Mikola are both Empyrean like their mother before them. Most Empyreans are granted what's called a Shadowbound Beast, a creature created by the two fingers that serve the Greater Will to accompany their Empyrean. Melania and Mikola don't have shadows, though it's been theorized that they didn't need them because they were essentially each other's shadows, but another Empyrean I'd like to talk about, Lunar Princess Rani, does have a shadow. Rani is one of the children born from the marriage of Renala and Radagon, of course before Radagon went and made babies with his other half. Rani has two siblings, but she alone is the Empyrean. Rani was granted a shadow by the two fingers, and his name was Blythe. I've been saying his name wrong for years, but I, I think I finally got it. Anyways, Blythe is Rani's loyal attendant, and he grows up alongside her. At some point, Rani turned her back on the Golden Order, and in doing so, would betray her ever so loving shadow. This betrayal would set off a type of failsafe inside of him that wouldn't allow him to go against the order that was placed there by the two fingers that created him. This inner conflict would drive him mad, and our character, if serving Ronnie, would be forced to slay him as he had grown to be too much of a threat. That was a lot of information that didn't have to do with Merica and Malekith, but I felt like a little context was necessary. When Merica proved to be an Empyrean, she was gifted her own shadowbound beast, Malekith. Malekith is incredibly loyal and just as powerful. He proved his strength when he did battle with the Gloam-Eyed Queen, another Empyrean who threatened Merica's order. The Gloam-Eyed Queen wielded a legendary weapon known as the Godslayer's Greatsword that allowed her to channel the Black Flame flames of destined death, a very dangerous power that, like the Flame of Ruin, posed a great threat to the Golden Order. When Maliketh and the Glomide Queen clashed, though, Maliketh prevailed. He would remove the Rune of Death from the Queen's sword and seal it away within his own weapon so that nobody would have access to such a terrible power. I believe this is when Maliketh was deemed the Black Blade and all was good for a time. I mean, how could it not be? Maliketh was pretty much unstoppable now. His armor description even states that there was not one demigod who did not fear him. 
One fateful night, though, somehow a fragment of the Rune of Death was stolen from Malekith and was used to assassinate Godwin the Golden. Malekith had failed his Empyrean, but I wouldn't be too quick to blame him. The remembrance of the Black Blade tells us something hard to understand. Merica's sole need of her shadow was a vessel to lock away destined death. Even then, she betrayed him. Well, how exactly did she betray him? It isn't clearly stated, but it's implied that Merica had a hand in securing a fragment of destined death so that the Knight of the Black Knives would be a success. She needed Malekith to lock it away, yes, but only until she needed it. Merica used Malekith just as she used Godfrey and the Fire Giant. And to be clear, it's obvious that Malekith is completely unaware of Merica's betrayal. So how exactly does Malekith represent diligence? Well, his story doesn't end at the Knight of the Black Knives. Malekith, now thinking himself a failure, would seal away the Rune of Death in his own body and dedicate his life to cleaning up his mistake. He would create the Bestial Sanctum, and we, the Tarnished, would collect Deathroot for him. This Deathroot is a direct result of Godwin being slain, and so Malekith, or should I say Garank, the name he took up after secluding himself, thought if he consumed all of the Deathroot in the land, that maybe the death would stop spreading. He was wrong, though. By consuming the Deathroot, he only now craved more death, and as to not further fail Merica, he decided to travel to a place that sort of exists outside of time. Garank traveled to the crumbling farm Azula. After burning the Erd Tree, we confront him here as to take the Rune of Death for ourselves, and he is clearly baffled by this. Tarnished. Why wouldst thou? Why? Similar to Godfrey taking his power back from Sirash, we push Garank to the edge and he only has one last resort. Malekith the Black Blade is returned once more and the battle is truly a sight to behold. He wields destined death beautifully, but no matter how good he is, he is fated to lose. With his last breath, he apologizes to Merica. Forgive me, Merica. The Golden Order cannot be restored. Even though he had been betrayed, even though his Empyrean had long disappeared, Malekith did his best to stop the spread of Deathroot and to defend the Rune of Death. If that isn't diligence, I really don't know what is. I called Godfrey the first Elden Lord, as that is his title, but we know that that isn't totally accurate. The remembrance of the Dragon Lord tells us that the Dragon Lord whose seat lies at the heart of the storm beyond time is said to have been Elden Lord in the age before the Erd Tree. This is a hard concept to grasp because the times before the Erd Tree and the Golden Order aren't incredibly well documented. What we do know though is that in this prehistoric era, the Elden Ring definitely existed in some capacity and that the ancient dragons ruled supreme. The people they ruled over were the beastmen that reside in Faramazula, and though I don't want to dive too deeply into their lore, it's clear that the dragons were on top. The one that reigned above them all, though, was Posidusax, as he is literally called the Dragon Lord. Being at the top of the food chain, though, doesn't automatically make you Elden Lord. That's a specific title given to those who are consort to some type of god, like Radagon and Godfrey before them were to Merica, or like our character can be to Rani. But what god did Posidusax serve, and more importantly, where where did they go? Well, I don't really know. Really, all we hear about this missing god is a line I omitted from the remembrance of the Dragon Lord just a moment ago. The final line reads, Once his god was fled, the lord continued to await its return. What is it with these gods and doing the people around them dirty? Vadi Vidya refers to this god as the nameless god in his video, The Lore of Elden Ring's Dragons, which is a fantastic watch, by the way. But this nameless god, for one reason or another, seems to up and vanish, abandoning their consort, Posidusax. Like I said before, they're definitely was an existing form of the Elden Ring in Faramazula long ago, and the Nameless God either got what they wanted out of it and fled, or it was the complete opposite. They realized they couldn't get what they needed and fled for those reasons. Who knows? At this point, I think the Nameless God could have been Merica. We know time in Farah Missoula is wonky for lack of a better term, and maybe Merica found this place and deemed Placidusax her consort before it occurred to her that she could use this place to travel forward in time to an era that better suited her. She also seems to be pretty all-knowing, so maybe she was able to see ahead in Farah Missoula through the constantly twisting time. But hey, that's just an idea and certainly doesn't have much ground to stand on, but the point is that Placidusax is now stuck in this place, awaiting his god's return. It seems like he's attempting to commune with his god in the same way that the two fingers do, but I think that Placidusax is doomed to wait for a literal eternity. Until, of course, we come along and mess up that immaculate patience that he was putting on display. 
We now somewhat know the story of the Lord of the Ancient Dragons, but let's talk about a different dragon, Fortisax, who I would argue to be the strongest dragon aside from the Placidusax. It's not totally clear why, but one day three ancient dragons decided to flee far in Missoula, likely in search of a place of more substance, or maybe in search of that nameless god. Shit, maybe they were chasing Merica. I just, it just hit me as I was recording this. I, 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 anyways, regardless of the reason, the three dragons, Lanciax, Grandsax, and Fortisax, all came to Landell. I think they were likely drawn by the Erd Tree, but again, reason aside, the three dragons attempted to lay siege to Landell and potentially claim the area for themselves. This happened in a time before the Night of the Black Knives, and so at this time, Godwin the Golden was in his prime. Grandsax, the largest of the dragons, was slain, but both Lanciax and Forsatax Force and Fortisax were spared. Both dragons were appreciative of the mercy that Godwin had shown them, and they both became essential assets to the Golden Order. Lanciax would take on the form of a human priestess and share her power with those of the ancient dragon cult, namely the Knight Vike, who was once a contender for title of Elden Lord. Fortisax, though, would become great friends with Godwin, and their alliance was legendary. Like I said, I think Fortisax is easily one of the strongest dragons ever, as he's able to wield lightning in a way that no other ancient dragon seemed to be capable of, but then throwing Godwin, someone who was able to to defeat Fortisax in battle on top of that, and there's just no stopping them. That, of course, was until the Night of the Black Knives. It's not clear where Fortisax was on that night, but we know for sure that one half of the Curse Mark of Death was carved into Godwin's flesh. At that same time, though, the other half of the Curse Mark was carved into Ronnie. When combined, the halves would kill you in both body and spirit, but split up as they were, Ronnie was killed in body alone, and Godwin was killed in spirit. Ronnie definitely got the better end of the bargain because she was able to remain in the lands between. Godwin was not nearly as lucky, though. He was buried in the depths under the Erd Tree, but though he was dead in spirit, his body still persisted. I mentioned earlier that the death root came from Godwin, and that's because his body, still engraved with the curse mark of death, intermingled with the roots of the Erd Tree, and thus this curse of death was spread all across the lands. This is where those who live in death come from, and why people like D, Hunter of the Dead, are actively pursuing them. Another character that ties into this story is Fia, the deathbed companion. We meet Fia in the round table hold, and she's one of the few NPCs that are warm and inviting. After some time, Thea reveals to us that she is Godwin's companion, and I have to be honest with you, I still have a hard time understanding what that means. The way she says it makes it seem like she was always Godwin's companion, but why would he have needed a deathbed companion? I'm probably overthinking her phrasing, but it's clear that Thea is dead set on laying with Godwin and ushering in the age of the Duskborn, an age where those who live in death can flourish. Apparently, D, the hunter of dead I brought up a minute ago, has somehow found one half of the curse mark of death, the one that was carved into Godwin. Fia kills D in cold blood and takes this half back. She then travels to the deep root depths where we can meet her again. Well, we see her after, of course, we defeat her champions. I'm not sure exactly why we have to defeat them if we are planning on aiding her, but it's likely some kind of precautionary measure. Fia will hold you and tell you that she needs the other half so that she can complete the curse mark of death and use it to achieve the Age of Duskborn. If we bring her Rani's half of the mark, then she will lay with Godwin in a, presumably, eternal slumber. Now we've got to bring Fortisax back into this. Fia, laying with Godwin, is prevented from fully realizing the curse mark's potential because inside of the deathbed dream, the lich dragon Fortisax has been trying desperately to stave off the death inside of his friend. I don't know exactly what staving off the death looks like, but this process has obviously corrupted Fortisax, as we see signs of death blight littering his body. This is a terrible fate, but one that Fortisax chose for himself out of the kindness of his big dragon heart. He cared for his friend Godwin and didn't want to see death overtake him. When we do battle with Fortisax and he is inevitably defeated, the mending Rune of the Death Prince is completed. I wish we got to see Fortisax before his corruption, but even in his Lich Dragon form, he was still fighting valiantly for his friend. Yeah, okay, I clearly put this one at the end for a reason. Estelle is a being that actually seems like he would fit better in a more f***ed up game like Bloodborne, but uh, here he is. Let's get a little backstory. Estelle is kind of like the Elden Beast in the sense that he was created by the Greater Will. That's pretty much where the similarities end though. You see, Estelle was made for a much more petty reason than the Elden Beast. In the Eternal City of Nokron, the Nox created a weapon that is supposedly able to harm the Greater Will and its vassals, the Finger Slayer 
blade. The Greater Will was obviously privy to this blasphemy somehow, and as punishment, Estelle was sent to the city to destroy it, and he was successful. The Meteorite of Estelle spell is, quote, a manifestation of the power with which Estelle leveled the Eternal City. We also learn from the Remembrance of the Natural Born that Estelle once destroyed an Eternal City and took away their sky. Also, quick note, it's pretty obvious that Estelle is some type of vassal for the Greater Will, so why is he called Natural Born in the Void? Maybe the that Greater Will created him in space, I guess? I don't know. Anyways, Estelle destroyed Nocron and then disappeared with their sky. You can see that very sky in your boss battle with him, and it makes for one hell of an arena. So how am I gonna twist this freaky eldritch horror into chastity? Sorry, saying it out loud is just ridiculous. Well, hear me out. Chastity is obviously the counter to the sin of lust. In my sins video, I talked about how lust isn't just about physical or romantic attraction. Lust can be a very strong yearning for things that are not seen as noble to Christ. If we use the greater will in place for the Christian God, then Estelle has only done exactly as God instructed him. Estelle assails the city of Nocron, steals their sky, and then secludes himself as far out of the way as possible. He now just sits in the Grand Cloister, either awaiting further instruction, or more likely, just waiting to need to defend himself. Estelle doesn't lust for anything, other than, of course, to serve his god, which is exactly what chastity is all about. Yes, it's a stretch, yeah, I know, but if you squint your eyes so tight that you can't see anymore, then it kind of makes sense. Still not sure why the f*** he looks like this, though, and why are there two Estelles, but only one is important? I, I don't know, man. Elden Ring is just a silly game sometimes. I said at the very start that this discussion is just for fun, and I hope you had fun watching. In doing research for this video, I feel like my understanding for Elden Ring's lore got much deeper, and that makes me appreciate the game even more. If you feel the same way, you should leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I really hate having to say it, but if I don't, sometimes people just forget. I feel bad that I just completely left the regal ancestor spirit out of this, but to be honest, there just isn't much information about it. I mean, there's not much information about people like Estelle either, but I, you know, I think we made that work. If I got anything wrong in this video, please let me know, and I will post a pinned comment where I'll make any corrections. A lot of the lore is sort of up for interpretation though, so just let me know what you guys think. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. GG's everybody.